It's my pleasure to introduce uh, Matt Kill from uh, Ohio State University, uh, who will be speaking to us on the topology of configuration spaces of hard spheres. <clears throat> okay, thanks, Peter, for giving uh, to speak in this seminar. And uh, thank you for uh, virtually attending it. And, uh, I haven't ever uh, presented in this format before, so I uh, hope you'll be patient. And uh, please uh, <laughs> feel free to interrupt with questions or comments, just as if we were in the same room. Uh, but also, <laughs> especially feel free to interrupt if we're having any uh, technology problems or if uh, if I'm doing it right. Uh, we have um, a, a Bauer scheduled for a seminar, is that right, including questions, Peter? Is that time? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, great. So I may uh, switch back to the, the camera uh, at some point, but I'm going to uh, switch to um, my sites and I'll start talking as if I'm just giving a regular slide talk. Uh, so let's see. Share screen. Everyone see that? My slide. Yeah, <clears throat> I want to talk uh, with you today about uh, config spaces uh, that uh, seem to arise naturally in, in um, mathematics and physics uh, and from a topological point of view. What are the topology of these configuration spaces? Uh, so interested in two-dimensional uh, configuration spaces, but I found sometimes if I talk about hard disks, that uh, people I mean like uh, you know hard disks for a computer or something memory and storage and that's not what I mean at all. So um, we'll talk about these uh, configuration spaces and I want to start uh, sort of at the beginning by talking about configuration space of points, which is uh, well known and well loved by uh, algebraic topologists and they actually show up in many other of mathematics as well. So we could, uh, in any, you know, space uh, on a manifold, if you like, uh, but I, we'll be able to uh, keep ourselves busy today, I think, with just a two-dimensional example. Endpoints in the plane. So this is the configuration space, which we'll just denote um, config n. And it's understood that it's endpoints in R2. And so each of these X1 through Xn represents one point in the plane. So each one of those um, has two real coordinates. And so they're sitting inside two n dimensional space. Uh, <clears throat> but there's one there's only one condition for the configuration space, and that it's that they um, the points are distinct. So we don't allow two points to be on top of each other. One think about this, one way people talk about this particular space is a comp of a complex hyperplane arrangement. Uh, if, if we could think of it instead of endpoints in R2, of course, that we could think of it as endpoints in the complex plane. And, uh, and saying that two points are the same is uh, saying those two coordinates are equal. So that's just some hyperplane in this n-dimensional complex space. And we're needing all of those uh, hyperplanes. So the hyperplane arrangement uh, and hyperplane arrangements and their topology is very well stated. And this particular arrangement is called the braid arrangement. And, and it's one of the um, first hyperplane arrangements you would study. And, uh, and so there's a lot known about it, topology. And, and, and you could say, in a sense, everything is known about this topology. And I want to sort of completely overview this. Uh, what we're going to do um, looking forward is instead of these points just being points, we're going to give a little bit of thickness, so then the points will become disks, and then things become 
sort of why more complicated uh, is known. So I, I would like us to be grounded first in uh, what is known, which is the case when there are points. So I say pretty much everything is known. What I mean is if we have endpoints in the plane, we talked about that configuration space, all allowable such configurations of indistinct points. What we know is all the homology, we know cohomology, and in fact, we know all the homotopy groups. So let me just say something about um, the homology. Um, make one point clear is that we're always talking about in a label or um, point. So there's another kind of configuration space that people like to study, which is um, you take the quotient of the space we're talking about by the symmetric group and um, just putting the point. So we just sort of forget the labels on the point. Also, a perfectly reasonable piece to study. People do see it. But We'll talk about sampled configuration in space. Uh, so one thing that you should know about the space is that um, the, uh, the homology, the integer homology of this space is a uh, free. So each degree we have uh, a free alien group. Um, so there's torsion and homology. So if we have the homology looks like then and it would have just to say, what are the batting numbers? What is the dimension, say, of real homology in each dimension? So, by um, is the, uh, the I number is the dimension of homology uh, with real coefficients and degree I. And if it's that familiar concept, uh, then you could just think of Betty I as the number of I dimensional holes. That's what people tend to say is uh, the. Way to think of them. So, um, so on the left we have the Poincaré polynomial. That's just sort of the definition of the Poincaré polynomial. We're writing down these betting numbers as the coefficients of powers of t, and so powers of t are just sort of placeholders. Then, what on the right is the formula, um, effectively the i betting number of this configuration space. So maybe a place to start is if uh, n equals two. We just two points in the plane. Uh, then the the claim here is that the Poincaré polynomial is just one plus t. And you can imagine that you know if you have two points in the plane, you could sort of translate them so that the first point is at the origin, and then the second point can be anywhere except the origin. And that translation can be done in a kind of a nice continuous way. So that's actually a homotopy. And the second point can be anywhere in the punctured plane. And the punctured plane is homotopy equivalent to a circle. So the betting numbers of the circle are one in degree zero and one in degree one. So, um, so with two points, the configuration space of two points in the plane is just homotopy equivalent to a circle. And so then its homology is um, ready to compute. But then this actually kind of sets you up to inductively compute the uh, higher configuration spaces and their homology too. Um, I want to give some hint where these uh, factors come from. So if you have the configuration space of three points, uh, the map to the configuration space of two points uh, by, say, deleting the third point. That's a nice map. That's a vibration. Uh, and all the fibers are homotopy equivalent. And one of the fibers is actually homotopy equivalent to a bouquet of two circles, two circles meeting at a point. The, um, the polynomial of that, of a bouquet of two circles, is 1 plus 2t. And then silly, there's a vibration of projection from uh, configuration space of four points to the configuration space of three points, and all the fibers are homotopy equivalent to a bouquet of three circles, and the Poincaré polynomial is 1 plus 3t. It's actually a spectral sequence that you to compute the homology or comedy of this uh, configuration space, and it's an especially simple spectral sequence where it just sort of factors, and, and you can kind of address that this is some kind of algebraic uh, equivalent. The equation we're looking at here, those factors on the right actually have some kind of meaning that you can see from those uh, vibration maps. And so here, with this uh, pretty simple formula, uh, we 
um, we can compute all the betting numbers uh, any configuration space for any n. I make one other uh, comment while I still have this slide up, which is that um, fix i, and we look at the i betting number, and then we let n vary. Um, it turns out that so now they we're trying to solve for uh, betty zero. Well, betty zero ends up just being one. Uh, we're going to solve for Betty 1. Well, you could kind of figure it out, and it, it, it ends up being uh, something that's just a quadratic in T. And in general, Betty I is a uh, degree 2I uh, polynomial. Uh, so, so we wanted to let N get really large, let the number of pen, uh, points go to infinity, uh, but fix the degree of homology that we're looking at. We could understand those asymptotics exactly, and that does the betting numbers would only be growing polynomial fast, and in principle, we could compute exactly what that polynomial looks like. Um, maybe one other thought while I'm still talking about the case that's very, very well understood, the configuration space of points, I commented that we actually even, in a sense, know what the homotopy groups are here. And what I mean is um, uh, the pi one, the fundamental group of this configuration space of endpoints in the plane, is um, is the braid group, or in this case, uh, I guess the free braid group. Uh, but what's a little bit amazing is that uh, pi two and higher are all zero. There's no higher homotopy, so this is a space that's sometimes called an uh, eilenberg maclane space. Or, uh, it's a sphere space if uh, pi to higher or zero means that it has a contractible universal cover. So, um, so it's hard to think of manifolds uh, where we know uh, all the homology and all the homotopy groups. Uh, so, for example, we certainly don't, for the two-dimensional sphere, we know all the homology, but we don't know all the homotopy groups. Um, but an example where we do know the homology and the homotopy groups would be, say, the torus, the dimensional torus. Um, the uh, B numbers are just binomial coefficients, and it's got a contractible universal cover. The universal cover of the n-dimensional torus is just n-dimensional Euclidean space. So you can think of these con this configuration space of n points in the plane as a little bit like a torus. It's a bit more complicated than the torus. Its fundamental group is much more interesting than just the free abelian group. But it's a space that uh, we understand pretty well. So um, um, now we're going to uh, talk about what we're really interested in today, which is uh, <clears throat> to give the points some thickness. So, uh, so if um, just give the points thickness and leave them in the plane, then it turns out we haven't really changed the topology. Uh, at least homotopy, uh, these spaces are the same. And we could put the point in the bounded region, let's say in a disk or inside a square. And if there's points inside a square, well, a, a square is, homo is, is homeomorphic to the plane, the open square is. So again, we haven't changed the topology. But if we do both at the same time, if we give the points thickness and put them in a bounded region, then sort of all that's are off. And, and it seems like anything could happen. So then here, uh, for this configuration space, that, um, the disk cannot overlap, which is this condition about uh, the distances between the centers of the circles have to be at least 2R. And then the distance from the center to the boundary has to be at least r. Um, uh, so the, the, these uh, uh, on the right are just the conditions that ensure that the disks uh, uh, not overlap and that they stay within the region. So now the configuration space, uh, it's not clear what's going to happen because, for example, let's Let's say um, um, I fix n the number of uh, disks that I want to have. I fix the region to say be a square or a disk, and I let r be very large. Then the total area of the disks is more than the area of the ambient region, so they surely don't fit in the region. 
well, it's okay. This definition still makes sense. It's just that in that case, the config space is empty. So, so we're, one point of view that we're especially interested in is to fix n, the number of disks, and fix the region r, and then let r vary. Let the range vary say, between zero and infinity. So I think as the radius is starting at very large, like infinite, and then shrinking to points, and at the beginning, the configuration space is empty, and at some point, the disks finally fit inside the region. Configuration space is non-empty, but maybe, um, yeah, the, maybe to get in, them in there, they're kind of stuck, and they can only kind of wiggle in place a little bit. Then continue shrinking them, and they have more and more room. And then um, at a certain point, maybe those disks still have some finite positive radius, but uh, maybe we might expect that the configuration space looks a lot like the configuration space of points. If the disks are small enough, maybe they actually act like points. Then, so we might expect that the topology changes a number of times throughout this uh, process of shrinking the radius, and it's the sort of thing that we want to study. Part of the motivation to study this is that this is uh, sometimes called the energy landscape or phase space for what physicists call hard spheres gas. So this is maybe the simplest model of matter that we could imagine is that your atoms are, are even three-dimensional, they're two-dimensional, your atoms are disks. And the rule is that you can't have two atoms in the same place, they can't overlap. Well, we express this as a as a energy potential function. The function on configuration space of points, you allow the points to be anywhere, and then kind of draw those little circle radius r, make the disk of radius r around them, and we'll say the potential of that configuration is infinite if any pair of disks overlaps and is zero otherwise. So it's called the hard sphere's energy potential. And it, uh, it's uh, been very well studied in, in physics. Uh, so, um, and, and they say something about it that they've they've studied this space uh, experimentally, um, both kind of patiently, and they find that there's some kind of phase transition uh, in uh, behavior of this space uh, as you vary the uh, race of the disks. Um, uh, this is something that physicists have found is uh, uh, what they think of is a liquid solid phase transition, even for hard spheres and even in dimension two, hard disks. Um, but uh, people are hard pressed to give an example, um, give an explanation of that. And in particular, there's no real uh, mathematical insight into that one way to think of this, and a, a really beautiful way that uh, G, the mathematician G.C. Rhoda kind of uh, stated uh, <clears throat> the situation, that, well, what if we, you have a whole bunch of carp, um, a bunch of pennies, and you just drop them on a carpet one at a time, and um, what's the probability that no pair of pennies overlaps? Think of this as encoding the question, uh, what's the volume of this uh, Configuration space. And what, what Rhoda said that's very, I think, provocative is he said, if we had a really good understanding of what the volume of that space is, he said, we, um, we would know why liquid turns to solid uh, at 100 degrees, or why water turns, <laughs> water turns to um, steam at 100 degrees Celsius. Um, by pure atomic considerations. And I gave this talk one time and Mark Gretzky was in the audience and he said, well, know why uh, that happened because that's the definition of 100 degrees Celsius. That's a good point uh, that, uh, that Gretzky made. But I think that what um, <clears throat> is saying here is that what we really like is um, to, and how does this volume behave as n goes to infinity and r goes to zero as some function of n? 
and making r some constant over square root of n, say, so then the total area of the disks is constant. Let's say the disks take up 50% of the area of the box, and you let n go to infinity. Um, the, what people think is that the volume behaves very differently than if disks take up, say, 80% of the area. So the maximum area is um, the close packing density of circles in the plane, which is about uh, 0 0.9069. And uh, so the physicists find experimentally that there's some kind of phase transition around um, make up 70 or 71 percent of the area of the square. And what, the way they find that is they try to sample a typical point in configuration space. Uh, and when they take that random point or a typical point in configuration space, then measure things. They measure, say, the angles around each disk and how well that correlated uh, with things around disks far away. And they that these correlations are much, much tighter um, around 71% of the area of the square than they are around 70% of the area. Um, I'm lying about those numbers a little bit, but I think it's between 70 and 72% of the area uh, where some kind of transition that's, that's known experimentally to exist, but um, nothing really is known mathematically. So, um, so basically, they, they find that when the um, area total area of the disk is you know, above about 71 or 72 percent, that all of a sudden a typical configuration is much more um, crystalline, that there's much more order in how the disks are arranged, and it's like they're getting into their, their crystallized or solid form, where with less than 70 percent, a typical configuration is much more random, and there's less configuration, there's less correlation, and um, relation falls off much faster between angle at this disk and angles um, nearby. So, uh, <clears throat> so what we want to do, this is just part of the motivation for us to understand these things uh, topologically. So it makes it hard to understand um, some of these trick things like uh, the volume of the space um, or the angles uh, around disk for a typical point or random point in the space. But we'd like to um, understand topological things that are maybe a little bit coarser in variance. We just want to understand, say, things that are homogeneous in variance. Is the space connected or not? Or how many holes does it have? Um, the, the, the dream would be that that actually sheds some light on the, on the physics. Um, inspiring quote, inspired me at least, uh, by Percy Diacono. Uh, this survey article of his uh, that was in the AMS in 2008, and the title of the article was um, I think Monte Carlo Revolution or something. He's talking about different applications of uh, Markov methods, Monte Carlo methods, and science really in mathematics and. And he exactly the situation, you know, n pennies on a carpet or n pennies inside of a square, and you know, get n how small it has to make r for the space to be connected, or or what are the main numbers? And he said uh, very little is known, and that was 2008. And I, my view is that now it's you know, 2016. I would still say very little else is known, but um, I'm going to report to you the, the little bit that, um, that I know, uh, you know in the time in this talk. So really, uh, if you're interested in anything I say today, then I warmly recommend um, Percy's article. Um, think of configuration space. So uh, this configuration space of disks. So we're going to think of the configuration space of points um, and function on that configuration space of points. And uh, then what an F does is it just tries to put disks down, and it, it puts little tiny disks down, and then it inflates them until 
a system pair bumps into each other. Either a pair of disks bumps into each other or one disk bumps into the boundary of the region. And so F tells you what's the largest your disks could be given centers. So this is a function, and it's a continuous function. It's not smooth, unfortunately, but it is continuous, and it's got various nice uh, features. And it's a function on a space that we understand pretty well, the configuration space of points. And the configuration space of disks that we're interested in is exactly the sort of super level sets or um, um, sets of the function. So we might understand this space config R that we're really interested in by understanding uh, the configuration space of points that we understand pretty well and by, uh, looking at this function. So it kind of feels a little bit like uh, Morse theory. Uh, and here's a picture of one of the mathematical heroes. Uh, uh, Going to try to fix me. My uh, advisors, advisors, advisors. Her, and I kind of consider myself a uh, um, fourth gen theorist. So here, one slide uh, crash course in Morse theory is they have a function on a torus, and we try to understand the torus by understanding the behavior of this simple, this height function, and in particular, the critical points of that. So here there are four critical points, and uh, I'm just looking at the sub-level sets of this function. So I'm looking at the uh, topology of everything below the line. So in this case, it's just a disk and it's contractible. It's homotopy equivalent to a point as we cross that first point. Um, then I raise the bar a little higher and I've crossed an index one critical point. Uh, and uh, then uh, more theory tells me me that then up to homotopy, all I've done is add a, I've attached a one-dimensional cell. And if I attach a one-dimensional cell, only a couple of different things could happen to the Betty numbers. Either Betty zero decreases by one or Betty one increases by one. And, uh, and it was the, the first of those. And here we were adding another one-dimensional cell. So we have, we have a bouquet of two circles here uh, to homotopy type. And then um, this is an index two critical point. So I haven't said much about the um, what is an index of a critical point here. It's uh, uh, it's essentially of the number of linearly independent directions by which you can kind of flip down. So at the beginning, that first critical point was index zero. Then two index one critical points, these sub points, and then this this maximum of the function was an index two critical point. Um, and Morse theory says that's something like building our space up out of zero cell, two one cells, and one two cell. And in fact, this is the picture that um, we've known our whole lives of the torus, where it's a square. That square um, with the sides identified, with parasites identified. So there's really only one corner of that square, and that's the zero cell. And there's two parallel sides. So there's really only two one-dimensional cells there. And then the two-dimensional cell gets glued in according to that um, you know, attaching map. So, so this is the one uh, slide overview of Morse theory. And, uh, but the basic idea is that by understanding enough about a function, then we might try to reconstruct things about the space uh, the function is on. Um, so uh, here's a, a basic theorem then. Uh, if you have John Milner, book, uh, Morse Theory, uh, which is a book that everybody learns Morse Theory probably looks at at some point. Uh, this is the first two or three pages of that book. And, and this theorem just says that the topology only changes at critical points. If we have a nice function, a function that's smooth, and, um, and critical points are isolated and non-degenerate, then um, if there's no critical points over some interval, then uh, these sub-level sets are, say, 
homotopy equivalent. And it's actually true in this case uh, that they're diff even stronger than homotopy equivalences, that they're diffeomorphic. Um, okay. So, uh, Yuli Brishnikov and Peter Bubinik and I wanted to try to understand this for confusing spaces of disks or spheres in higher dimensions to have a theorem that said the topology can only change so many times. Uh, we, we make definition, we say that a configuration of disks is mechanically balanced. Um, well, I think a picture is worth a thousand words here. These are the only pictures of, um, these are the only types of mechanically balanced configurations for three disks and a square. So the, you can put weights on those edges of the graph, of this contact graph. So if you think of, at any point, if you think of all the vectors as pointing out, that the forces uh, at that point all cancel out. So it's, it's mechanically balanced. So you can think of these as sort of jammed configurations. Uh, so the, the red configuration on the left, those are definitely jammed. Those disks cannot move. And that's the densest configuration of three disks and the square. So going to that story from earlier, if, we're shrink if we have three disks, we're trying to fit a square and we're shrinking the radius from infinity to zero, that configuration on the left is when they first fit in the square. And certainly the topology changes there. The configuration space goes from empty to non-empty. So these are the only other times that the configuration space topology changes. And after this, uh, then it acts like a configuration space of points. This is essentially the uh, the content of the theorem that uh, you, Peter, and I proved. So, so we this function f, which we call the tautological function or the tautological Morse function, even though it's not really a Morse function in the sense people usually mean. It's not smooth, not differentiable. Uh, but we know that mechanically balanced configurations play the role of um, critic points in Morse theory. So if, the, if you believe that these are the only types of mechanically balanced um, configurations for disks and a square, then it follows that the topology only changes for as we vary the radius. So, uh, so the theorem uh, that is we like one step in the direction of um, having a um, kind of more theory for uh, uh, like this. Uh, but really a first step. So for, we're saying that the topology doesn't change in between critical points if the critical point of these mechanically balanced configurations. But the next thing you might like to know is a good definition for the index of a critical point. Um, and so you could have a theorem that says if you cross an index i critical point, it's like attaching an i-dimensional cell up to happy type. So that's something we've been thinking about a little bit, but uh, isn't written down yet. So, so I actually want to mention uh, over the course of this talk today, maybe a few different more theoretic approaches to understanding these spaces, which have each had um, some success, but a um, um, little bit limited success. Each of these more series, I think, is kind of begging to be further developed and uh, understood. So this is the first one, we call this uh, min type Morse theory, um, but it's Morse theory for a function that's kind of a minimum of a bunch of more behaved functions. Um, so the theorem I, I wanted to mention, uh, and that was published in uh, IRM, IMRN a couple of years ago. So I'll tell you about uh, a more computational approach. So now I'm not going to worry about proving some but somewhat inspired by this uh, earlier work, uh, Willie and Peter, we'd like to um, find the mechanically balanced configuration. So, so here's again of what it looks like for three disks. Um, and then as when we get different radius um, uh, range, uh, we can say what the topology of the configuration space is. So this is a theorem, but I think you could prove this as a theorem for a three disks in a square. Um, <clears throat> I, uh, so when the radius is bigger than what we see on the left here, then the configuration space is empty. Uh, and then the radius is just uh, 
large enough that they fit inside the square, then those uh, thoroughly fit, and they just kind of wiggle in space. So each, um, each point, of each uh, component of the configuration space, I would think, is uh, contractible, is homotopy equivalent to a point. In 24 such regions, because I can permute the three disks, and so that gives uh, six, uh, six, but then this disk that's stuck in the upper left corner could actually be in any of these four corners. So six times four is 24. And so this, it should look like just 24 points, the configuration space, if the radius is in this range. But then the radius gets a little bit smaller down to 0.25, and then two disks can uh, get past each other. And uh, the conjecture would be that the configuration space now acts like um, two circles. Uh, so, so I learned, by the way, the, um, the uh, mechanically balanced configurations by what I think the index should be. So this is like an index zero uh, critical point in a Morse, in an actual smooth Morse function, because it's like adding zero cells, and this is like adding one cells, and this should be like adding a two-dimensional cell. So if you believe that, that there really is some underlying theory of index for these critical points, which hasn't been discovered yet, uh, but is consistent with our intuition, then then just counting the number of cells already tells you something. The thing is that we only have zero and one-dimensional cells here, and it, that there's two connected components, because you can kind of move things around on circle, but if you have disk one, two, three, versus one, three, two, you can't get from one of those configurations to the other. So that's the two different connected components. There's orientation. And if you make the disks a little bit smaller where one disk can actually screen the other two, then the space becomes connected. But we've, so, but we've still only had a zero and one dimensional cells. So just kind of simple formula for the, um, or a one-dimensional uh, W complex, which say Betty zero minus Betty one equals you know V minus E vertices minus edges, and it's connected. Uh, uh, and the number of vertices and edges, how many zero cells and how many one cells have we gotten? Then we can conclude how many how many there are. What's Betty one? And surprisingly, we get at this point that Betty one seems to be thirteen. This is probably a bouquet of thirteen circles uh, in that radius. And then what a uh, comment of what Yuli and Peter and I actually proved is that once the radius is smaller than this, then it's homotopy equivalent to three points in the point. So at that point, we understand the topology completely. So this is a kind of toy example where we see the topology changing a few times with three disks. And uh, I don't claim to prove this is a theorem, what's on this slide, but I think you could. But we're making more disks, it's going to get uh, hairier. So four disks, and uh, Bob Pearson and I spent a lot of time scribbling napkins, and also we did some computer simulations to find mechanically balanced configurations. And I would guess that these are the only types of mechanically balanced configurations for four disks in a square. I would take my life on it, but I, I'm guessing these are the only ones. And here's... Here's a guess as to what the betting numbers might look like, and and I'm not sure uh, it, about this, especially somewhere here. We're really making a guess. Uh, we've only had zero cells and one cell, at least according to this kind of conjectural theory that should be here. And so, just kind of counting the number of cells and out how many connected components there are should tell everything. We then start gluing in higher dimensional cells and and, and more complicated. But I, but this is a guess as to what the betting numbers look like for every range of radius. And my um, I want to point out something. This is what we're confident in, is these are the betting numbers for four points in the plane. Um, that, uh, notice that these uh, betting numbers uh, get huge, that there's some range. Well, even Betty 0 is 24 at the beginning before it goes down to 1. And Betty 1 at some point is 193. So I think at this point, that's homotopy equivalent to a bouquet of 193 circles. Remember, there's only four particles here. So the is may be surprisingly complicated. And Betty 2 also takes a turn um, 
Dame de Hamaji. So it's in this uh, physics journal, this paper that uh, I wrote with um, Garrelson and um, uh, Forum, who was an undergrad at Stanford, and um, Jeremy Mason. Uh, we studied this, and we we also tried to do this for five disks. So the critical points we found for five disks using kind of computational, using experimental methods uh, and uh, really breathe some new life into this uh, project, uh, finding these. So I'm going to say um, how we found them, because this is what I would to mention as maybe the second flavor of Morse theory that's been uh, interesting for studying these kinds of spaces. I would say we have kind of a computational Morse theory going here. So the was put down five random points in a square and then just sort of inflated um, disks around them and the disks touch just let them push off each other and when they hit the boundary, um, let them push off until they get trapped. And if you do that kind of thing, you'll get these kinds of configurations. So if you put five points uh, down randomly in the square and inflate uh, the disks, each of these three some percentage of the time, and uh, this one or this one, you know, I can't remember what the percentages are. Say this is like 72% and this is 25% or something, but a, a small percentage of the time, maybe even less than 1%, uh, you get this. So we definitely found this for the first time when my grad researcher at Stanford, Jackson Gorham, actually found this configuration uh, doing 1,000 or 10,000 you know, random points in the square and pushing them apart. And these disks are really kind of trapped in the corner here. So so that gives you essentially an index zero critical point. It's sort of a local, um, you know, um, max or local min for, for this kind of function. Um, <clears throat> then one thing that you can do and that we did initially was um, given two uh, uh, Mins or um, for whatever your energy potential function is, you can try to find a low energy path between them. So this is called the nudged elastic band method, and it was developed by um, computational chemists. And uh, for the saddle points and some of these energy potentials are pretty interesting for uh, these particle systems. And so they want to find the saddle point. What I like to do is that you have two two points, the local mins of your energy potential, you could just try to join them in a straight line path and not worry about the energy and then start flowing every point on your path to um, uh, gradient flow of the energy potential. But the problem is since each one of your uh, path is at a local min, your path just tries to pull itself apart. So what they do instead is they make that uh, piecewise polygonal path, they make all those little segments springs and spring constant has to be tuned, but they um, it holds together. So there's a, a force balancing that um, that's trying to pull itself apart. And somehow this actually seems to work pretty well. Where in many cases the um, the path kind of hanging on a saddle point, and you can find signs this way. So in this way, we found some index one critical points. Leave the story of um, Jeremy's idea of how we found some higher index critical points uh, for another time. Just um, since I'm running out of time in my talk, but um, so what wouldn't uh, bet uh, amount of money necessarily that we've got a complete list of critical points here? But these are the ones we found, and it might be a complete list. We did do a lot of computer searching. Um, these are the only ones we found, but some of them, you know, kind of like this guy in the bottom right corner, they only came up comparatively rarely. So, so whatever our processes, our flow towards these higher index critical points, um, it's it's easy to believe that there's some that are missing just because their basins of attraction are so small that we just miss them. So we also found some critical points which we classified as degenerate and which we don't think that the ball changes there. But again, that's a story for another time. And then we want a histogram, 
and uh, we found that you know most of the changes in the topology seem to be between 0.6 and 0.175. So, <clears throat> so that's suggestive, and kind of seem at a glance that if the uh, radius is less than 0.16, that things are very kind of uh, fluid, liquid-like, and that if the radius is much greater than 0.175 they're almost forced to have some kind of symmetry or, or crystallization. So, so we were kind of trying to hint at a liquid solid phase transition with, in a system with only five particles. And uh, one of our referees at the physics journal kind of um, wasn't about that, said, you know, statistical mechanics only works when you have billions of particles. But then uh, we dug a little deeper into literature and in our response to that referee's complaint, we put out, um, Randy Kamian might have been the one who pointed this out to us, that in the 1960s, people had asserted a liquid soft phase transition in systems with as few as a few dozen particles. And maybe it's a little bit of uh, chutzpah that we're trying to do that with only five particles. We're really not saying that we see a liquid solid phase transition here, but just that something's happening. There's a lot of changes in the topology in a very um, narrow region. And, and uh, to me, it's fascinating that even in a system of five particles, that maybe the topology is changing a couple of dozen times as the radius varies. So that's a suggestion that the topology can actually uh, capture. It's rich enough to capture something about the system, about these systems. So, um, so here's a, a guess as to what the betting numbers are. We spent a lot of time trying to figure out how many connected components there were. And if these are really like index zero and one um, um, cells being attached, uh, and if we know how many um, critical cells are of each dimension and, and uh, uh, components there are, then we can deduce uh, something about how many loops. And this would be that between radius 0 0.1686 and 1692, that, um, it's homotopy equivalent to a bouquet of 2,700. 61 circles. So a lot of people in applied to here, um, they, uh, uh, these kind of point cloud methods, building uh, uh, via torus rips, filtration, and computing persistent homology and so on. And so I just want to contrast this with, the, with that approach. Maybe these spaces are much simpler. They're semi-algebraic sets. We know the equations that cut them out exactly. So it's it's less messy than real life data, but the but we're really using a different point of view computationally. We're just trying to find the critical points only, and trying to kind of put them back together to recover information about the space. And I think we can say here we we would guess that you know between 0 0.1686 and 1692 that Betty one is exactly 2,761, not approximately, and maybe that for certain kinds of you know static, um Examples, you know, if, if our point set is an algebraic variety or a manifold that we actually have the equations for, maybe we can get homology using computational methods like this and, and get more information. Um, but it also be um, useful to try some of these methods with some real um, data too. And of course, um, you know, computa computational chemists do that with uh, with such elastic band method at least. Um, is a picture of a of a circle embedded in the configuration space um, going through a bunch of the critical points. So maybe in the remaining couple minutes, I'll just tell you quickly about uh, some work in progress with McFeeden. We're hoping to have a preprint done this year, and it's something we've been working on, oh, I say now for five years or so, but we have some results. Uh, and um, so, so that we look at um, disks in an infinite strip. And this is a kind of nice uh, balance between a bounded region and just the whole plane. It's not interesting to have the disks in the whole plane, um, but it seems very hard to understand them if they're in a bounded region, a square or a circle or something. So he said, well, what about in an infinite strip? So it's sort of bounded in one direction, but unbounded in the other. And um, what we're really interested in is the betting numbers and that's what it looks like uh, for four disks. So the, these are the width of the strip in terms of number of disks. So if you've got four disks and your strip is just one disk wide, 
say, one us epsilon disks wide, then you just get its homotopy equivalent to just 24 points. You can permute the disks, but you can't get them past each other because your strip isn't wide enough for them to move past. And then um, at this extreme, we get the buddy numbers of the uh, configuration space of four points in the plane. In fact, I think Yuli and up here in my approach would prove that, that if the strip is wider than the total number of disks, then, um, then you get the metopy type of points. Uh, there's only one little subtlety about compactness, but I think it's not a problem. But what's interesting is that this range, the betting numbers are very large. That um, if you're a, uh, two disks wide, then you get a lot of one. For example, so he think the uh, betting numbers are, are for five disks. And just notice that there's a lot of homology um, on this side of the line, and then on this side of the line, homology is stable. That uh, it agrees with the um, configuration space of points. So what's shaded in blue is the homology that we understand very well. So uh, find that that is actually the case in general. Um, so I'll show you a, a picture of what this looks like asymptotically. Maybe I'll just give the simpler uh, picture. So Lou here, so we're fixing the width of the strip in J, the degree of homology that we're looking at, and then N go to infinity. So if the strip is four disks wide and we're looking at homology in degree six, then what we're saying is that homology is roughly three to the N. But we get into not only on the first order asymptotics, which is exponential, but also on the second order asymptotics, which is polynomial, to a constant factor that um, bet, bet six of, you know, the strip is four disks wide, grows like three to the n, n to the eight. And so, but actually what we find here is that the betting numbers grow exponentially fast on this side, and they grow polynomially fast on this side. And in fact, on this side, they're stable. So actually, it's not just that these are all separate configuration spaces. There's inclusion maps between them as you widen the strip, and they're all included in the configuration space of end points in the plane. And what we're saying in the blue range is that that inclusion map into the configuration space of points on the plane is actually an isomorphism on induces an isomorphism on homology in that degree. Um, so we talk about this um, in the paper we're writing as an analog of uh, a liquid gas phase transition. When blue is when the strip is wide and you've taken all the pressure out of your um, system, and so the, and the, the particles act like points. So we think that is like the gas-like state. But what's happening here we think of as liquid, and liquid is what we don't understand mathematically. Uh, uh, people. We don't know how to prove uh, regularity um, for Navier-Stokes equations, and and looks complicated and has lots of vertices and walls in it. And uh, maybe we're seeing that uh, topologically that the integration space actually has lots and lots of holes. There's tons of homology, and that's capturing some of the complexity of of the liquid. Uh, this is work in progress, and we hope to have a preprint up, um, you know, sometime this year. And I'll I'll skip. Uh, the uh, you know, of how we prove anything about these things and just uh, mention a few open problems. So one thing that's uh, wide open is to describe the asymptotics of the bounded numbers of uh, any bounded region. So it was a lot of work for us to describe the asymptotics of the betting numbers um, for this kind of unbounded region, disk strip. Um, I mentioned that, that that was actually hidden in there in one of those slides that I I skipped was the third kind of Morse theory there. We, we used discrete Morse theory, and the reason we're able to use that is in this case, when we have um, disks in a strip, we actually have a cell complex that captures it up to homotopy equivalent. And it's a complicated uh, cell complex um, where every cell is a product of permutedrons. So it's not as nice as a simplicial complex or something, but regular CW complex, it is a polyhedral complex, and so we do combinatorics on it, and the Morse theory allows us to simplify it to a complex with far fewer cells as an upper bound on the betting numbers. So, and so there was a third kind of Morse theory there, but um, 
don't know how to uh, describe the asymptotic for the Ben inverse for any bounded region. Um, and then so we don't even know what's the threshold for connectivity in disks in a square. And um, even roughly speaking, so clearly suffices to make R uh, like one over n, so round one over n, um, because then they don't even fit it from one side of the square to the other, and the homotopy type equals uh, is it homo it's, it is the same as the points and endpoints in the plane. <clears throat> but um, on the end, if R is bigger than some constant over square root of N, then they can definitely get stuck. But there's a big gap between, you know, one over N and one over square root of N. And so we don't even really know roughly what's the threshold for connectivity for N disks in a square. Do um, we know? And um, this talk has been about the, um, Kinds of core invariants of these spaces, but uh, but like to know more subtle things about the geometry. So you know the volume I mentioned at the beginning of the talk seemed to be a kind of fundamental question. Wrote a pennies on the carpet question. But what about diameter? So I like to think of the the fifteen puzzle. You know the uh, where you have sixteen squares in a grid, but then when the squares is deleted, the squares are numbered from one to fifteen, and you try to get them back in order. Well, if you had instead like an n squared minus one puzzle, then that would be kind of a combinatorial analog of this. It might be that the space is connected. You can get from any state to any other, but it might involve a lot of moving pieces around. So it may be that you could get this space, maybe it's connected, or maybe just restrict your attention to one connected component of it. Um, but I've in a situation where you can't get from one disk or disk to another permutation of the disks, but it involves a lot of willing the disks around, and the diameter is huge, and might indicate something like a solid state of the matter. But it's a, it's a dream uh, to understand about the diameter of these spaces. And, and uh, really the dream, the, the long-term dream, is to understand the topology of these spaces in a deeper way, and especially in an asymptotic way, and maybe then we're seeing topology underpinning um, phase transitions that are interesting from a statistical mechanical point of view. I'll thank uh, my collaborators. I mentioned um, papers. The first is with Yuli and Peter. Then the second is with Gunnar, Jackson, and Jeremy. And the third one in progress is with Bob. And Percy Conus was a postdoc mentor for me who got me started in this whole line of inquiry and our time and attention. And um, since so we're uh, all there, uh, I'm happy to uh, answer any questions or comments anyone has. All right. Uh, all right. So uh, are there any questions for, for Matt? For me? Yes. Oh, um, can you say a few words about how this min type Morse theory works in particular? Your theorem about, you know, the, the topology doesn't change if there's no. If yeah. Some, yeah, something like a flow. Exactly. It's the right idea. We want to make a flow. Um, so, what we basically do is, um, is if you don't have a mechanically balanced configuration, then what we prove is you've got a little neighborhood of your point where you can flow and we're going to increase this function everywhere continuously in that neighborhood. But then requires some care because um, we've proved that that flow exists and it's not canonical is one issue. And, um, and we also only have it locally. So we have to kind of use, uh, you know, partitions of unity. We have to patch together all these local flows into a flow and, and make sure uh, that, that it still works. You can prove that for some finite time, you can flow and just apart a little bit. There's no mechanically balanced configuration. Unfortunately, it's not in a canonical way, uh, but you can do it. There does exist a flow, and that's good enough to know that. But then that flow, you haven't changed the homotopy type of the configuration space. Okay. Yeah. Other. I have a question. Um, 
uh, I'm in a lab with uh, granular material people. So they, they, my colleague just left. He's a physicist and was very interested in in configuration phases uh, for particles, of course, which is what they are studied. So how far can your method stretch in order to number of particles? Do you think you could get something to up to, to I don't know, hundreds of particles at some or I, I think for right now, hundreds of particles is a reach. Um, uh, what we, Jerry and I have done some more experiments with instead of five particles, we did eight. And I have some hope that maybe we could say something interesting with 10 or even 20 particles. But we, as soon as we do that, we have to start to um, be careful about what exactly do we want to ask. The, the guess is that the number of different types of critical points is um, going exponentially with the number of particles that, you know, for some with 20 particles, that maybe the topology changes um, can be millions of times. Uh, it sounds crazy, but it could be the case, or thousands of times. So maybe we don't want, at that point, for a system of even 10 or 20 particles, maybe we don't want um, a complete story of all the topology and all the critical points, but maybe a coarser picture. Maybe we just want to find a sampling of the, of the critical points, for example, that's a good sample from them. So what, so, an, or another more modest goal than recovering the, the higher topology and the higher homology would be to understand the dendrogram um, or persistent by not uh, for uh, the applied topologists. Um, so I want to know how the connected components appear and how they merge together. And that's to already be a pretty complicated story with five particles. But I, I think we might be able to do it for 10 or 20 particles. But one that we can do that would simplify it a little bit is look at the um, on the configuration space instead of labeled. So we quote by the symmetric group and we don't worry which disk is which, then uh, then I think, um, well, we're dividing the number of critical points by n factorial. And if n is 10 or 20, then that's substantial uh, savings. Um, so even for five particles, that's a factor of 100. Uh, so, um, so there's some hope. Uh, but so I, I, of course, I would really like to see some um, topological experiments for hundreds of particles thousands of particles, but, um, and there are some topological experiments to be done with that many particles, but I'm not sure what they are yet. Uh, the experiments that we did are too fine and too computationally expensive for, um, to answer your question, our method would, there's no chance of them going up to a hundred or a couple hundred, uh, but I don't know how maybe related methods, and if we um, relax the questions, we're asking a little bit there may be some questions that we could ask for a system of 100 particles um, that are a bit coarser, and it would be very, very interesting to see anything, I think, about the topology of these spaces with so many particles. But um, so if I don't know how to do that, and it's just a dream, and I've just been thinking about incrementally about how to say something with 10 particles or maybe one day 20 for now. All right, let's thank Matt again for a great talk. Thanks a lot, Matt. Thank you.